everybody. Welcome to Wisdom from Our Neighborhood, and this is our Lessons from the Road Good. series. I'm happy to have Alana and Hamza with me. Uh, Anila can't be with us tonight because she's off doing uh, doing really good work as always. Um, uh, this is uh, part of Paths to Understanding, uh, formerly Neighbors in Faith and Tracy Levine Center. Our mission is to bridge bias and build unity through multi-faith peacemaking. But this series is is a collaboration between the, the Pomegranate Initiative, Maps Amen, and Paths to Understanding. So I'm just happy to, to introduce once again, Alana Suskin, who's an educator, an activist, and a writer. She's the editor of the progressive blog, JewSchool.com. She served as an assistant rabbi at Addis Israel in Washington, DC. She reaches across faith traditions to fight Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. And also with us is Hamza Khan, who's the founder of the Plural Pluralism Project, an organization working to empower everyday Americans, hailing from diverse narratives in our political process. He's worked as a campaign manager and communications consultant in local and national campaigns and was presented with the Rising Star Award by Politico magazine. Together with Alana, they have founded the Pomegranate Initiative to counteract Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. And you all, you all live like in Maryland, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's the awesome. East Coast version of Washington, except I think you guys have better scenery than we do. We have well, like, no, the, the Appalachian Trail is nice. Yeah, but we have the White House down the road, and so that's not really, <laughs> not really that great these days. Well, I, I think we're going to have to really bring on our, our competitive natures here and uh, really try to do that. So speaking of competitive nature, really? so, <laughs> so you know, we're all stuck at, in Zoom land, you know, here uh, for the most part. But I thought we'd start off tonight just, just by giving each of us a few minutes to talk about the kind of work we've been doing, you know, kind of on the road, on the virtual road. Um, in working to counteract Islamophobia and anti-Semitism and other kinds of, of bigotries. And so, uh, you know, Alana, I'd be, be happy to hear from you first, just for a few minutes about what you've been up to. Sure. I mean, as you say, we're all kind of like here in virtual land. So um, we've been pivoting to try and figure out like how we can bring our work out into the world, even though we're not physically able to be there and build relationships with people one-on-one -on -one in person. So I, I've been doing, you know, aside from working on, you know, building and pivoting um, and working on creating um, sessions that we can do with people via platforms like this one, I've also been doing a number of outreach pieces with um, local imams. I've done a, I'm actually doing a series, I'll be doing one tomorrow night with an imam in Northern Virginia. Um, we're going to be talking about common values between Judaism and Islam and Americans in general, secular Americans. We'll be doing that tomorrow on East Coast time at 7 p.m. Um, on Facebook. And so that's like the fourth or fifth one in a series that we've been doing. Um, and so I've been doing things like that, outreach to black churches in our area and their leaders. Um, I think that's really super important at the moment. And even though it isn't specifically Islamophobia or anti-Semitism, I think a lot of those pieces interact really strongly that, um, you know, when you talk about these kinds of uh, prejudices against religion, the same people who have those prejudices also have those prejudices, uh, you know, who have that, the racism is built in and there are racial components to all of those as well. So I think it's really important for us to include that racial component in our work. Hamza, how about you? Where do I start? First of all, I want to clarify our use of terms here. Here in Maryland, we're pro-diversity, Terry, and so we don't call it Zoomland. We call it Zoomistan. Okay? <laughs> we show respect to our communities of color and immigrant background. I'm just, I just want to get that out there. So a lot of Zoom calls, a lot of Zoom calls in the last couple of weeks. We spent a lot of time talking to communities of faith in every tradition, just like Alana doing outreach to black, uh, black churches. Spent a little bit of time this weekend with Ethiopian Orthodox churches and Eritrean Orthodox churches. Um, for those of you not familiar, those are two of the oldest Orthodox churches in the world. There's a debate between whether Ethiopia and Eritrea are the oldest Christian countries in the world, or if Armenia is the oldest Christian country in the world. And, you know, being pro-diversity, I'm going to side with, her, uh, with Ethiopia on this one. So that, having conversations with them about shared values, for one thing, but also moving beyond shared value conversations to figuring out how do we begin to organize in the digital world uh, to do uh, social justice work? How do we uh, commit to sedek, as we say in Hebrew, uh, during this really interesting time? And so from there, conversations have, have begun to happen with organizers outside of faith communities, people 
who belong to secular communities or of no faith whatsoever, and closing the gaps between our understanding of digital organizing, which is limited in the interfaith world, with folks who do this for a living and, and living in the millennial Gen Z sort of you know, interwoven space that I barely understand, even though I'm a millennial myself. Um, it's, I'm, I'm an old soul. That's why I'm spending my uh, Tuesday night with you guys and not on Netflix. So, <laughs> so not saying that you're old, not saying that anyone here is old. Um, but, you know, that being said, yeah, there, there's been a lot of interesting work around. All right. So now that we have a shared framework, we have a shared goal around understanding mutual helpfulness. How do we take that mutual helpfulness and that mutual understanding into the real world? and deliver groceries to people's homes who might need it. Um, that's one, one interesting conversation going on right now between Christian groups and Muslim groups in the, in the DC area is that we have quite a number of seniors in the Muslim community and the black Christian community who need their groceries delivered or who are, you know, who are, might be retired or might have lo lost a loved one who was their source of income. And as a result of that, uh, they might be in jeopardy right now, given the crisis we're having with COVID across the country. And so that, creating those networks, creating spreadsheets, Slack networks um, a level, to a level of discord, which is something I'm just beginning to understand that I'm sure Ian can like uh, jump in and tell us all about from behind the scenes. Uh, you know, working on those new networks to, to support one another, I think has been really cool and exciting. And I think that's really the future of interfaith for all of us is that we've now understood each other to a degree. And even if we don't fully understand each other, how do we, uh, work together to cement those bonds of being fellow Americans. So, I really appreciate all of that, and and you know we um, it, it passed to understanding. I, I've been doing a couple things this last month. Of course, we had a Holden Interfaith Week, you know, which where we produced uh, six webinars in a row, which was super exhausting and also quite wonderful. We had a, a Jewish artist and, a, and an Islamic artist on to teach us. How to do some of that and I've actually bought some art supplies uh, and hope to begin to, to practice Islamic art uh, because one of the patterns that she showed us was from Moorish Spain and my my ancestors are from there so I I'm going to be exploring some of that. You knew um, there was a reason over, I liked you Terry. Oh yeah exactly <laughs> over the next few months I, I plan to be like like spending some some more time like like working on that art. Of course I, I'm really terrible at it right now but it was really fun fun to do. Locally, you know, there's a lot of movement in, in my hometown of Anacortes right now where I live uh, to, to work on the issue of race uh, institutionally and structurally. And so I've, I've been part of a group for the last year working on, on addressing some of those institutional and structural issues. Um, we're, we're the IDEA group, uh, um, inclusion, diversity, and equity in Anacortes. And so we've been at lots, I've been at lots of protests on the street. We've had protests in Anacortes every week and now every two weeks uh, since the, the murder of George Floyd. And we're starting to work to, to, break the, to break up some of the work so that we can address the way we teach history in, sc in the school system and work on the hiring practices of the school system, of the police, of the city, of a hospital, and then also working on how do we in a smaller town of about 20,000 people, um, that's about how many folk are on the island, how do we kind of create conversation between people, um, especially during, during the time of COVID, where people can, can have those real heart-to-heart -heart conversations, engage new information, engage in stories, um, so, that, so that we can like build, keep building a movement. And uh, so we're, we've been working on that locally and then I think for, for neighbors and faith in general, trying to get more clear about what it is we're to do, because um, we're, we're re really a merger of a couple of other interfaith organizations, and we're trying to discern like what our focus is going to be. And I think, you know, one of our foci is, is going to be, is, um, which is what we've been doing, is working to counteract religious-based dehumanization and, and dangerous speech, which we know leads to and supports violence against against those groups and once as you both have said once you get violence toward one group that's rationalized in a human community it just spreads to others really easily but the other thing we want to do in washington state which is becoming more diverse so there's about something like two million folk moving into western washington in the next you know you know 20 30 years and so we have all kinds of communities that have been pretty white 
and are now seeing the emergence of other kinds of religious traditions. And so I think what we want to do is work um, within those communities where there's an emerging kind of diversity and help develop the kind of partnerships uh, that, that help recognize everybody as neighbors, everybody as you know, fellow citizens, everybody as common partners in building a stronger community. And I really think that's kind of where our, our mission is gonna be. So we wanna tell the stories of and strengthen interfaith organizations that already exist, but mostly we wanna help create organizations that, that are in relationships that don't exist yet. And that I, I think is kind of where we are and we're still in that imagination and envisioning phase. And then figuring out what tools and resources do we need to gather so that you know communities can do that work and, and not have to reinvent the wheel over and over again. So that's kind of what, what's, what's been up for us. And it's, it's been pretty, pretty, pretty fascinating and pretty fun. So right now we're a nation in which there's tremendous numbers of challenges. And there's a lot of changes taking place in our culture. Um, what are some of the changes that we see that we need to work on? I realize this is a target rich environment. Like there's a lot we can talk about, right. but what are a couple of the things that, 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 that you, you two feel are so important right now for, for us to work on in this, in this particular country? And Hamza, I'd love to start with you if you, if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> so Alana, I think saw a Facebook post from me earlier today, and this is in the political realm, but I think it ties back into what we're talking about. There has been a war on elitism in the United States for quite a while, going back probably to the founding of our country. And what's very interesting right now is that for the first time in many, many, many years, we have a democratic ticket that does not include an Ivy Leaguer. Um, and I think What's really curious about this is that, you know, Joe Biden going to U-Delaware and I believe Syracuse for law school, don't quote me on that for sure, and then Kamala Harris going to Howard University for undergrad and then UC Hastings. What's interesting about it is that they're both still very accomplished individuals. I mean, they are lawyers um, and they are successful politicians, a vice president and uh, the senator from the most populous state in the union. And one of them is a black woman. Uh, who was a member of a Divine Nine sorority. And all of this kind of comes together in a really interesting time in America where we're, re we're, we're talking about what it is to be American. What does faith have to do with our relationship with America? Kamala Harris is half Indian American and she is half African American and Joe Biden is a Roman Catholic. And we have this amazing coming together of very diverse American traditions in a way we haven't had before. And that helps us evolve as a society into understanding what our future is going to be like, and then also being more accepting of one another. The othering conversations that Terry and I and Alana have had to have since 9-11, which was 19 years ago in September, uh, we might not need to have those othering conversations anymore about how we have commonalities and how we need to embrace those. We might be able to move beyond that and say, now that we've embraced one another as equals, or we're beginning to with the rise of a new generation and hopefully a new hope in November. Uh, I know this is supposed to be nonpartisan, but you know, knocking on wood that we all survive November uh, <laughs> into January and beyond uh, with a new president. Uh, but you know, where we're going with that is that now that we've, we've done that important work, maybe we can get back to the work that Alana has been doing with the Poor People's Campaign that we've been wanting to do as Christians and Muslims around social justice issues in America, not just dealing with racial justice, which is incredibly important in all of our traditions. Again, if Ethiopia is the oldest Christian in the world and it's inhabited by people who are blessed with ebony and black skin, it makes us think about, so why in that case is there such a bias in, amongst so many Americans who claim to be Christian against people of color? If that's where their faith truly began to be institutionalized was in Ethiopia, maybe we need to reevaluate how we understand uh, faithful traditions in the US and Christianity. But, but coming back again, I think we're coming to a point where we can focus on public policy again as people of faith. We can actively lobby and advocate in our state capitals and the federal capital um, on, a, on an equal footing again, without us having to have the peace and love conversations all the time. I think we've established that, or we're going to be getting to that point. And I would love to see more Christian ministers taking an active role in helping us reform our government 
and deal with issues of corruption. I'd love to see rabbis playing a more important role in helping us reform our very broken judiciary uh, at the state, local, and federal level. So that, that's what I'm excited to see happen, as we say in Arabic, inshallah, with the grace of God. Thank you, Hamza. Lana, what's on your mind about what, what changes need to, that we're, we're kind of facing in this country? What do you think we need to be focusing on? Um, you know, I, I, I have to admire Hamza's um, optimism here. And I, I do actually want to reinforce that, you know, Black women are among the most accomplished demographic group in the U.S. They're the most educated and, demographic group in America. The most yes, educated. Yes. I mean, they have the most number of PhDs. enormous, enormous resources, enormous potential that we have not given them the opportunity to actually live out um, in a large part. And I, I agree with Hamza and hope that that is something that we will see a lot more of. Um, at the same time, you know, I, I also want to pick up on that thread where, you know, Hamza talked about, you know, we don't have, uh, we, we have an anti-elitist trend in the U.S. And that is true and it's good. But at the same time, I also think that um, one of the things that we really are going to have to struggle with um, probably for a long time is the sort of the, the, um, the tangential piece, which is the anti-elitism often plays out as anti-expertiseism. Um, so that we have this whole community of people in the U.S. who are, you know, who think that, um, you know, doctors should not be listened to about medical issues. <laughs> Um, you know, that kind of, you know, where, where clearly the opinion of the local politician who may support because of cultural reasons, you know, is the one who informs them about, you know, what, uh, what knowledge they should have. And it's a really disturbing thing. There's a, there's a principle in Judaism called Tinuk Shanishba, which literally means a child who has been kidnapped and raised away from the Jewish community. And we have this, um, so a Tinuk Shanishba, a child who has been kidnapped and raised away, it was, it, this is something that was a problem for Jews for a lot of history. People would kidnap our children and raise them as some other religion. Um, so that, um, those children were understood to not really deeply understand how to live in a as Jews in a particular way. And they were, you know, so when they did things that were considered sinful, um, right, they were largely forgiven for those because they couldn't be expected to know what those things are. And I feel like a significant amount of our population in the U.S. are these, are like these children who are taken and kidnapped and raised away from, you know, uh, access to like real knowledge and real science and an understanding of the of the principles that are going to help us move forward and conquer things like global climate change, let alone believing that there is global climate climate change, um, you know, conquering disease and those things. And it's difficult because I think that the sort of um, the approach that the Jewish community took towards these children is in a certain sense the right one, which is that they can't really help themselves right? They're ignorant. They're not wicked. And yet it's really, really very difficult, I think, for Americans as a whole to see one another that way because it's some of the opinions which are being touted by those pieces of the community where they're being raised with these anti-expertise ideas um, is really very harmful to people outside or even within their own communities, you know, whether that means because they're, you know, GLBTQ or because they're of another race or another religion, um, or even if they're just not conservative, um, you know, that's, that's often very problematic. So we, I think we have a lot of trouble like overcoming those barriers. And that's something I think that is, I think we're going to be working on that um, for a long time. And I think a piece of what Hamps and I are trying to do at Pomegranate Initiative, a large piece actually, is, is to be able to reach out to those communities where they've never met a Muslim and they've never met a Jew or they, maybe they've met one, but you know, they're not, they're not gonna invite one to their house because ew, um, or God knows what they're like, or you, you know, what have you, and to sort of overcome those boundaries. And I think it's, it's largely what kind of work you're doing as well. And it's really hard. I mean, I know even for me, I find it really hard to keep in mind that these are good people who were raised in such a way as to make it hard for them to overcome it on their own. I mean, there's something to add there in terms of being raised and this anti-intellectualism anti that we're seeing across America. 
there is a, a real sense of grievance and neglect in many communities across the U.S. where we're seeing conservative beliefs touted. And then they're not actually conservative beliefs. They're more populist beliefs that are being anointed with a conservative mantle, but, they're, but they don't really fit into that world. And what that matters to us as people of faith is that um, in the Islamic tradition, one thing we come across again and again is the woeful ignorance of the pagan Arabs towards Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his message of peace. The, the, the pagan Arabs simply did not know what Islam was. They simply heard a rumor and, and ran with it, uh, as many people often do even in our modern society. And so the challenge we have is how do we best uh, deliver the epiphany that America is a place for all people and the people living in urban centers are not interested in destroying the way of life of people in rural areas and vice versa. That's where we're having the, the disconnect. And I think what Pomegranate Initiative aims to do is we'll definitely work towards addressing that, but it's also something we need to think about here is, okay, so how do we now make the folks in Tacoma, Washington, Seattle, Washington, Washington, DC, three, three Washingtons, all feel like they are neighbors with people east of the Cascades or on the Eastern shore here in Maryland uh, and, 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 and bring them together in a way that's more organic than we're seeing today because it's, it's simply not happening. Zoom calls exist, but I'm not seeing a lot of them go across these, you know, these large geographic barriers, the Chesapeake Bay and the Cascade Mountains on one side. So that's, that's something I've been thinking about. How do we do that as faith communities? Terry, if you'll forgive me for just popping in there for one more second. I yeah, actually want to, I want to, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to let Terry talk. We're going to just keep bouncing it back and forth. Hamza. Yeah, um, it's fine. So I actually want to kind of Diversity connect to something you said at the beginning, which was the sort of the sense of grievance, which I think is something that the Poor People's Campaign does indeed talk about a lot, which is that, you know, there's there there are real reasons for those grievances. And I think both urban and rural populations both suffer from the, the effect of the fact that we have an elite in this country which is not concerned with people who are struggling um, and that our laws have actually largely been set up to make them suffer more. And in, you know, instead of actually having people be able to talk to each other and say, actually in this setting we need this and in this setting we need that, but both would be served by the following thing, yeah. um, we have people fighting for resources and the people who set up that, that struggle um, benefit from it. And I think, you know, Reverend Barber and Reverend Theo Harris um, have said it very well, which is that this is, not, this is not about white or black, and it's not about east or west or rural or urban. It's really about the struggle between the poor and the rich. Right. Um, and not, not in the sense of like, let's kill all the capitalists. You know, I, I, I'm not building guillotines or anything. But in the sense that there's a, real, there's a real struggle right now going on about even talking about poverty in this country and talking about the conditions and the pieces that feed into it, um, all of which tend to enrich people, whether that's, you know, like a lot of money being spent on the military or, you know, companies being allowed to dump sewage into people's front yards. So I, that's, I just wanted to sort of agree with you there. Now I'll let Terry talk. <laughs> Again, public policy issues. Public policy issues are front and center for all of us of faith, and we need to be leading on them rather than sitting and allowing um, communities to suffer any longer. It's simply unchristian, it's un-Islamic, and it's un-Jewish. It's also un-Hindu, un-Buddhist, and a couple other faiths we could talk about. Well, you know, part of it is that that I think uh, that, that Christianity in, in this country um, has kind of forgotten, you know, what, what is kind of central to the, to the Christian scriptures, which is that the real condition of human beings matters to God. Like the real conditions of human beings right now matter to God. And so about, you know, as you both may know, about five, six years ago, I began to go into churches to, to try to help create more allies for our Muslim neighbors. And a lot of that had to do with encountering some of the racism and religionism that is a part of the white supremacy, you know, that is like been woven into Christianity in this country and in, in the experience of people. And so what, what I think many, many progressives were expecting me to do is to run around and call everybody racists. You all are a bunch of racists and there's things wrong with you. Um, and, and denounce our current president and that sort of thing. 
but what I actually did in all those, like something like 250 conversations, you know, presentations, was to help us understand the things that are eating away at our, at our common bonds. Um, one of them is that we're lonely. You know, 50% of Americans are chronically lonely, and that's even made worse by COVID-19, because you can't yeah. just go hang out at the store or, or the park or whatever as, as easily. We have Zoom, Terry. You're telling me Zoom isn't a replacement for human interaction? It, it, uh, it's okay, but, uh, but boy, you know, um, oh, some nothing. people don't have Zoom. Oh, Some people okay. don't have that technology, and and uh, and 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 are, or you just don't don't have access to that. And I think, I think another key thing that I that I kept saying to them is that wealth and income inequality in this country is at a near all time high. You know, eighty four percent of stocks are owned by ten percent of the people. So when the stock market goes up, my dad used to think that means the the economy is good, but we've seen in the last six months that the economy is like having real trouble, at least a third of the economy is like down to nothing. A third That's of the wild. economy's kind of hanging on and a third is like acting like there's no problem at all. And so, and so we've seen wealth and income inequality grow in this country since about 1975 and to the point where 0.1% of the population has as much wealth as the bottom 90%. And, and that creates a whole level of scarcity that then, that then amplifies the kind of bias and bigotry that people feel. And because they look around and they see a more diverse country and they pretty much figure, well, you know, cor you know correlation, you know, you know, it must be causation. And the reason that I am suffering, the reason I'm losing my status as someone who has a, a reasonable living is because there's, there's people of color around. And of course, most of that has to do with the fact that mechanization and automation are taking over. So in rural communities, you know, why is it that there used to be like, you know, five farmers along a road and now there's only one of, one of those houses is owned by a farmer? Because capital do no longer needs labor for it to succeed. That's so exactly right. Well, it's not, that's not all of it though. I mean, we also know that productivity has gone up where totally. wages have been completely stagnant. That's yeah. one piece. But totally. the other piece is that um, part of the way our policy has directed uh, monies yeah. is into actually less efficient systems. So for example, I was reading, I found this fascinating. Who are the, who have the most efficient farms in the U.S.? Do you know? Who are the most, what are the, us. where, what is the source of the most efficient farming in the U.S.? Please tell us. Organic farms. It farm. is not corporate farms. It's Mennonites and, um, Amish. Uh, and the Amish. Yeah. Why is that? Because when mechanization came in, they only bought what they already had money for. And the, the Amish actually largely didn't even buy those materials. And it's actually the mechanization made farms less efficient. Corporate farms are actually extremely inefficient, but because they're bolstered by huge drafts of cash, Subsidies. they have grown and grown and grown and taken over family farms, which actually are relatively efficient. This is actually very true. I thought you were going to say family farms, but I didn't want to presuppose. Um, well, and the, the other part of that, as a, as a kid that grew up working on a wheat farm, okay, so understand, like, my dad harvested 600 acres in 40 days with, like, you know, 15 people, 22 mules, and a kitchen crew of eight, you know, and, and that's how they harvested 600 acres, right? Today, my, my classmates harvest over about 10,000 acres a year in about 40 days um, with four people because the, the combine is, is a 40 foot cutting you know, edge, a header we call it, yeah. and it goes about six or seven miles an hour. And so they just don't need any people out there. There's just no need for them at all. And so my hometown had to, they had to pull together a, a bunch of money just to keep a grocery store within 30 miles, they would have to drive 30 miles each way to get to a grocery store if they hadn't put that, put that together. There's a town so here I, in Maryland, uh, Poolsville, yeah. sorry to interrupt, just down the road from uh, where I am. And it's about 12 miles to the closest grocery store, which is not a family owned grocery store, it's a national chain. Yeah. Uh, and it's well outside the limits of the town. It's a farming community and the farmers don't have their own grocery store. And so I think in a lot of ways, like 
there's this, there is a, there's an anti expertise trend in many respects, because we have kind of an emerging oligarchy in the country. You know, so the money's all flowed upward, you know, due to all of these factors that we're talking about and more. And then we also have a country where, where a situation where people think about the ideals of the nation as if those ideals are our history. Yeah. When in fact they're not, like they're not our history at all. And so, and, and think about the future um, in denial of our history and, and then you know, perpetuate a, a culture which is going to keep making the same mistakes over and over and over again. And I think, I think all of those are some of the dynamics that, that really concern me. I, I'd actually even throw in a, another, maybe a little tiny, not quite a grenade, maybe like a, a half a exploding rotten fruit, something like that, which is that I would even say that um, some, of the, the, some of the point that it underlies that's not quite the right language. Some of the things which you hear from the nationalist populist folks, what is underlied by them, the attitudes are wrong, but the, un the underlying value is actually something that I think that, that progressives could agree on, which is that there are values which we're abandoning, which we should not abandon. Things like traditional religious values, which is why I think religion actually has such a very important role to play. In Judaism, we have an extreme uh, value of the dignity of labor, that y that everybody should work, and that it's important to work, and that work is is a dignified thing to do, and it's important, um, and that you know there's all kinds of things that you can that you know that that you can sort of push aside in order to work and make an honest living, um, and I think that that's something that that that. Uh, conservatives and progressives share that's an ideal or the the values tr some traditional values like fidelity right i mean there's a lot and i and i have to say like in the progressive community you do see a lot of like disdain for the idea of fidelity and the idea of you know a monogamous marriage and things like that and i think that's very concerning and i think that that's part of the disdain that you often see in sort of these uh, they're not conservative really communities, but they're communities which call themselves conservative. And I think some of those values are actually things that many of us either should or could agree on, but because they tend to get framed in, um, in ways that perpetuate other bad things, certain parts of our, of the progressive community wants to abandon them and throw out the baby with the bathwater. So you know, like, you know there's I mean? a lot of these values that I would definitely love to see readdressed from a progressive religious perspective so that we can all be brought forward together. And I think many of those are some traditional American values as well. I mean, certainly that, you know, the drive to innovation doesn't have to come at the expense of the dignity of labor. You know what I really miss in this country? People being polite to each other. I, I have noticed in the last two years the great a, a, a very progressive decline in people just being friendly to one another and being nice in arabic we use the words akhlaq or i guess in arabic it's ikhlaq in urdu it's akhlaq ikhlaq wa adab which means manners and etiquette we are we're struggling with that as a society americans used to be very much known actually for being very very polite when immigrants would come here from the rest of the world I know that there's a, a, a terrible uh, rumor of us being ugly Americans when we're abroad. It's not really the case as a person who's traveled far and wide. It's not true. Um, immigrants from every country would say, you know, Americans aren't very bright, but you're very polite people. You're so friendly and full of life. And that, that seems to have gone out the window. I think partly it's because of social media and the, weaponization of social media by um, by Russia uh, to destroy the US. Uh, Putin is, after all, a former KGB agent. Um, but then also, I think it has to do with the rise of this white nationalist movement that disguised itself for so long as a conservative movement. I mean, what often separated conservatives and liberals was the fact that liberals were a I mean, were stereotypically seen as being a little less polite than their conservative neighbors, conservatives within the system. 
on old fashioned values, traditional values, you might say family values, liberals were, were not so interested in that. And we saw a very interesting, uh, um, we saw a very interesting breakdown of that during the, the um, Clinton administration when Tipper Gore was leading the movement to uh, stop CD music, CDs from having um, explicit lyrics and the battle between these liberal forces in California against this, you know, center left democratic woman from Tennessee who was trying to fight for family values. And that's when the culture wars really, really um, began to happen. It didn't, I don't think, I wasn't alive then, but may, but maybe Terry, you and, and Alana might know better from, from your older um, siblings. Uh, I don't think that, you know, Memphis, Tennessee, and Atlanta, and some other, some other, um, other major cities in the South were necessarily conservative um, in the 70s and 80s. I think they were just as liberal as other places in the U.S. And then during the 90s and the 2000s, because of the bifurcation of, the, of America, um, they got assigned, you know, the South was just, you know, blanket blanket painted as this conservative bastion that hates everyone who's not white. I mean, obviously there's a history of racism uh, in, in the deep South, which, you know, we're still coming to terms with, but I have a sense that folks were just as willing to engage in conversation as anywhere else. There, I think the breakdown really came from the failure of us all to communicate and maintain our national cohesion around shared values of being polite to one another more than anything else. Thank you, Fox News. I hope you're watching this, Laura. <laughs> Well, and, and but, but there's there's a whole there's, so there, there's so many things here. I mean, first of all, we, we are I think right now there there is so many of us that at least understand each other you know, to be exclusively um, you know tribalistic. We, we're exclusive to our in group. We are the only ones that are holding up you know what what are considered reasonable values, and everybody else is you know, is, uh, is not worth, not worth really talking to. The, and the other part of it is, you know, that, that we had, you know, CNN and, you know, have this crossfire talk show, right. In which you just had people on air screaming at each other for an hour. Um, as if there's not a broad consensus amongst 80% of the population uh, about certain kinds of values that are really important to us. And then we have the weaponization um, through, through you know uh, Rush Limbaugh and other kinds of radio hosts, um, basically chipping away at, um, at, at democratic values, um, at the idea that people who are opposed to you are um, are reasonable Americans who love the country as well, and so we're in this really exclusive you know sort of you know, tribalistic state where we're just so angry at the people uh, on the on the three percent of the extreme opposite from us that we don't see everybody between us and them. And, and so, and then we'd see the weaponization of conversations around family values as if the only values that matter are, you know, are, are sexual ones or ones around marriage. I mean, for goodness sake, in the Hebrew scripture, there's, there's many different models of marriage going on there in the Hebrew scripture, as far as I know, right? Um, you know, and so, and so we, we've seen the weaponization of a lot of these conversations in a way that that continues to divide us it is it, in a sense is kind of fascist in terms of it breaking us into little bits of people that can no longer have a conversation. So I guess what I wonder is what do our faith traditions have to offer this context where we have so many of these kind of challenging issues and dynamics, what are some of the common stories? What are some of the, the values? What are the, that, that, that we can bring forward and offer into this, into this very fractious conversation? Alana, would you be willing to, to, to go first? I mean, I would even start with, you know, there's a Jewish saying, Derech Eretz Kadmala Torah, which is basically means uh, sort of, I mean, etiquette's not really Derech Eretz. It means like the right way to do things in the sense of, you know, speaking with kindness and modesty um, to others and, and doing the right thing with other people comes before Torah, comes before you know, religion and you like both in the sense that you can't do Torah until you have Derek Eretz. 
but also right in the sense that you you ought to right both that it one makes the other possible and also that one is needed for the other um and i think that's just you know that's just to echo hamsa that i i, I do think that if one of the things that's really important is for us to find ways to speak to each other in ways that are kind and modest um it, modest in the sort of the the, the broad sense um, and I, I think it would make a huge difference on both sides to be able to sit down and even if we never agree with each other. Um, and I, it's funny. So I have a, I have a wide range of people who follow me on Facebook and other social media, some of whom are extremely conservative. Um, and I generally, you know, I, I don't really ever ban people from my page, almost no matter what they say, if they're consistently cruel then I, that's the only kind of people that I take off. And I think I banned somebody for advertising on my page once. But, um, but basically, I don't say you can't say this or you can't say that. And it's funny because I have gotten a lot of people saying like, why don't you block this person? Because they're, they're, they, they just don't learn. And I'm like, well, you didn't learn from them, <laughs> right? Have you changed your opinion because of what they said? Okay, so they didn't change their opinion because of what you said. Me I think it's worthwhile just to have that person there talking to me, even if we never change each other's opinions, you know, and when they're not around, I, you know, if they go away for a while, when they come back, I say, hey, I'm glad to see you again or whatever, because I do think that's important. I think really that even just the conversation by itself, exclusive of the content is important um, because as long as you're in contact with another person, as long as you're talking to them, they still are going to regard you as a human being. Like as long as you can keep coming back time after time, you can say, okay, I have a relationship with that person. Okay, we don't agree on things and maybe we really don't agree on things, but as long as they come back, there's a chance that they see me as human and I see them as human. So further down the line, maybe maybe we'll be able to cross some of those bridges or at least meet in the middle somewhere. You know, I think, I think fundamentally right now we're in a, we're in a place where, where there's, there's just tremendous anxiety and fear in the, in the country on many different levels. And I, I think that we're being tempted in this moment to forget how to recognize other human beings at, at a really, I mean, a really fundamental level. Um, I, I also will say that I think that we've got a fairly significant portion of the population that has bought into some some falsehoods that that basically make them against liberal democracy. And I think that's really dangerous. And and I think our current president has has tapped into a lot of that. Um, but back to what our traditions can offer. I mean, one of the things our tradition can offer just at a root is that we believe that there's one creator of all the universe and of all human beings, and that that, that, that creator created human beings in our, in our diversities um, in the image of God. And, and, and so we've lived in a culture which for 500 years has sort of prized the kind of a racial caste system and also kind of a, a religious caste system where Christians are first and white people are first. And I think we can remind people that that's actually not um, a part of or faithful to the Hebrew scriptures, the Christian scriptures, or the Quran. Like that is just not part of, of the message. And I, I think that that's really important. I think a second thing our tradition can offer um, is I, I, I sense a lot of folk like around the whole topic of which statues remain up and which statues get taken down, almost in a position of feeling like they're, they're not being true to their ancestors if they allow you know, some of these public displays of what we value to be, sh to be changed. It's uh, but, so interesting you put it that way, Terry. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah. It, it just, you know, think back to the story of Abraham. Mm -hmm. um, in the Islamic tradition, uh, we believe, you know, Abraham's father protested and said, this is the way our fathers have done it and our fathers have done it. You would have me break from my fathers yes. and my ancestors. And here you are talking about statues and these statues, which are really just idols, uh, being valued because 
of the tie they have back to people's ancestors. So it's interesting that we've come back as we've moved away from traditional Christian values of tolerance and acceptance, because this country has had many different Christian groups yes. operate in the same place at the same time, many of whom did not like each other. John Adams did once famously accost someone uh, for being, um, as I recall, being a, a sh either a shaker or it, I think it was a shaker, simply because they had a disagreement over something rather petty. Uh, and so, you know, you think about that for a second and you go, huh, I mean, that's why we have the First Amendment, yet yeah. we've allowed the First Amendment to be eroded to the point that freedom of speech simply exists for those who have a populist or supremacist right. narrative on either side. Yeah. There's progressive supremacism and there's white supremacism. Um, and I'm not really sure that's really helpful to any of us, but this idolatry, this modern idolatry comes as we've stepped away from traditional values and from family values almost yeah. as if the devil was leading us there. Well, and I, I, and, and I think that our, what our tradition says is that, is that we, we've seen ancestors uh, be willing to be changed by encounter with, with their ultimate ancestor, which is God. You know, Abraham was willing to, to change. Uh, there's, there's, there's story after story after story of people who were willing to change the basic understandings of how they deal with life and community because they were willing to honor their ultimate ancestors. So even though my dad and I disagree, I'm still honoring my dad because my orientation is to the creator of the universe. And the last thing I think, a gift that I think our traditions can bring is, is one that it is okay to repent. It's okay to change. It's okay to be wrong. And that in fact, recognition of one being wrong in part or recognition of a, a large, um, change that we need to make as a society uh, doesn't make us bad. In that moment, we're actually, we're actually being a, you know, fulfilling a part of what our tradition like longs for. It, we, our traditions long for a transformation of the individual and society so that we can live together in peace. And I, and I, I think we have a lot to offer in that conversation and, and uh, including with a conversation with more conservative or evangelical sisters and brothers in the country who I know often feel left out of these conversations. I think we can have some conversation with them as long as they're willing to, to not be the only voice in the room, you know? So Hamza, what do you think our tradition ha traditions have to offer in addition to what we've been talking about? What don't they have to offer? There's a reason they're traditions. Um, yeah. the, the conversation of dialogue is very important in the Islamic faith. Um, so chapter sort of Gathrun, which focuses on relations between people who will never accept Islam and between Muslims focuses on agreeing to disagree. But then throughout the Quran and throughout the Hadith and Sunnah, we see that there were plenty of non-Muslim actors who played an important role in the development of Islam and also in protecting it and allowing for other faith traditions to thrive. Uh, and the idea of pluralism, the idea that we can live amongst a society where we can borrow from others and bring in the ideas of others is very important. We had in the Islamic faith a similar um, situation in our early history as we do today in, in America between a, a dominant white narrative um, of white, you know, a, a narrative of white supremacism. At, we had something akin to that in the narrative of, of Arab supremacism in the first century of Islam after the Prophet peace be upon him's death. And what happened there was that the Arabs won a lot of wars and they therefore thought that God had endowed them with the divine right to rule all of humanity and that they were superior to people who weren't Arab. And the family of the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, no, you're not. You're equal to all people. This is where the Sunni and Shia divide, by the way. The mm -hmm. Shia strongly backed that position that all people were equal. The Sunnis eventually did. They believed in it from the beginning, but they were terrified of the evil Arab kings. But what we learn from that interaction is just how easy it is when you win a bunch of wars in a row, where you have a dominant narrative that's established for a sense of nativism, jingoism, and racial supremacism to set in. And the way Islam dealt with it is that we, you know, a lot of innocent people died, but eventually the path corrected itself. We like to avoid the innocent people dying, but as much as possible here in the US, but as we've seen already, so many innocent black men and women have been killed by those who abuse the right um, 
the privilege to be a law enforcement officer. And what's sad about that is that the media narrative has now turned us against all law enforcement, even though so many law enforcement officers themselves are people of color who are struggling to do the right thing in their communities every day. So what I think we can take away from this is the power of the minority voice, the power of the voice of even one person acting like Lot and being a just soul in a Sodom and Gomorrah, or the voice of an, a single Adam deducing, not Adam rather, but a single Abraham deducing the right thing to do. So it comes down to the act of a single individual who can inspire an entire community to change. I think that's one thing we can take away from all of our traditions at the same time. It starts with us, each one of us, doing a positive act upon our neighbor in public, demonstrating solidarity. One of the most important, uh, I'll, I'll be quiet after this, one of the most important images from this past year is, uh, is an image of my friend uh, Rich Parson's daughter, which was um, shown in the Washington Post. His daughter, who was white, blonde, very beautiful, vibrant young woman, wore a t-shirt, a white t-shirt with on the back. She had scrolled on it. If they start shooting, get behind me at an equal rights rally in downtown Washington, um, which I thought was a very powerful moment to see a young person with white privilege using that privilege and offering their body up, much, much so as in the Christian tradition of offering one's body up as a sacrifice to protect the other lambs of God. I thought that was very beautiful and very in line with Christianity. Wow. Alana, what do you have, what's on your mind right now? You know, I, I was, I, I can't help thinking about, um, you were talking about the idea of repentance, um, sort of in the middle of what you were talking about, about what, what our traditions have to bring. And so in a few days, um, the Jewish community is actually going to enter, begin to enter into our season of repentance. We have a month called Elul, and then we have the high holidays, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And really, it lasts even beyond Yom Kippur, but this whole season, which is just focused on repentance. And it's so interesting. I mean, all three of our traditions have a really deep connection to the idea of repentance. And yet, it feels to me, and maybe I could be wrong, um, it feels to me like we often see or that there's a trend or something currently in the United States to be um, unapologetic in the, in the negative sense, you stand know, I mean, ground. very well, stand your ground, but I mean, very famously uh, last year when, you know, the, um, the 45th president stated that he had nothing to repent for. And, and I do feel like that that's, uh, that's sort of a, a poison that's seeped into the society as a whole. And I think that's a part of the, the lack of, of politeness that we've seen. But also in general, like even in our religious traditions, there seems to be a focus on ourselves um, rather than on, and, and that's okay if the focus on yourself is how can I do better as opposed to how have I been wronged? Um, and I, you know, and I think uh, that's not something that's unique to any particular community. I feel like that that's sort of a problem in the United States as a whole that we're all very much focused on how other people are wronging us rather than what our responsibility is to help others. And I, I would really love to see um, a national repentance movement, you know, in all of the, in whatever tradition that you happen to be a part of. And if you're not part of one, feel free to borrow. Um, you know, like my own tradition says that you, you know, where God forgives for sins between a human and God, only the other person whom you have wronged can forgive you for wrongs between yourself and another person. And I think that's something that, um, that we've kind of lost, that the idea that, sure, there are things for which you're not going to be able to fix it in this world. That, you know, there, there be, you know, like, um, I don't know, maybe an example might be the sin of racism, which we are all suffering from because it is part of the foundation of our country. But as individuals, we can't fix it. We have to fix it on a, on a larger basis, on a structural basis. Um, even though there are things we can do as individuals, as a whole, it takes a structural approach. But th at the same time, as individuals, we are also responsible for a great deal of interactive, um, let's call it sin, for lack of a better word, that we could be changing and that those sort of individual and structural wrongs feed into each other. And a, 
part of the reason why we're not able to address them is I think because of that sense of unapologeticness and refusal to take responsibility or if we take responsibility, you know, it's a, you know, there's a, there's a certain sense of entitlement to, um, gosh, you need to fix my problem first. I, I don't, I'm not quite putting my finger on it. I, I hope I'm kind of getting, giving a sense of selfishness. It's not exactly selfishness. It's just a sense that self-absorption victimhood maybe, but I don't want to say like victimhood the way like you often hear in the, you know, like, oh, those millennials, they're all victims. Like, I don't think that that's actually true. I think it's more a sense of that there's a, there's some kind of flaw in the gem, right? Which, you know, is, is shot, it's, it's sprinkling the light in the wrong direction, right? I, I don't know. Maybe you guys can say it better than I can. Well, well you know, so, so I just, so a couple, I mean, I think we're, we're, we're getting at something really difficult and important here. Um, and so back to what you said around, instead of asking how we've been wrong, we are focused on how we've been wronged. And of course, what's important about this to say, and, and, and I, I need to say this as the, as, the, as the white Christian male dude, you know, that, that we've lived in a society that has wronged people. And wrong people institutionally and systemically, and also through you know, uh, in, in, you know, through interpersonal bias and and uh, intrapersonal you know absorption of all of that bias you know into, into people's lives. Um, but I but I think we're in a moment now where we have to ask ourselves: Do we want to keep living this way? You know, do we want to keep living this way? Um, or are, are, are we going to start to strive for the ideals in our founding documents, for, for honoring the human being, not only the, the individual who's homeless, but the fact that there's 500,000 homeless people and more every day now that COVID-19's economic impacts are, are really hitting. Um, I, so I, 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 think there, I, think we, I think we can re begin to remember, you know, that, that, that we, we, we have to strive for a more perfect union and and that that striving honors the ideals. And as a person of faith, that that striving honors the creator who made us. And, and, and that that striving is hard and it's worth it. And that striving is not just for me to have my, my issues addressed, my grievances, you know, uh, healed. It's so that all of, all of us can come together. Um, so I, I know all of us are struggling to put our, our, our finger on something tonight. But I actually think that that's like where we are as a country. We have to strive to like be able to even frame the questions right. And it's, it's going to take a lot of time for us as, a, as a, I think a country to, to begin to frame that in a way that helps us all begin to work on our part of the solution. Maybe also the other piece could be that we, the, if we can strive together in a more unified way, it might be easier to also take responsibility together for all of those wrongs rather than dividing ourselves into subgroups, which it's this one is wrong in this way and this one's wrong. And those are all real things. We have definitely wronged all kinds of groups in this country and we continue to do so. Right. But perhaps in coming together, we would be more successful at fighting those and taking those wrongs down. National repentance, rather than trying to do it one at a time, maybe. Right. Your your faith has a tradition of national uh, repentance, doesn't it, Alana? Going back. To oh yes, David. I, I mean, well, national repentance is actually. I mean, people think that Yom Kippur is actually the day of repentance for individuals, but it, it's actually that season focuses on national repentance. And Rosh Hashanah is not just the New Year. You know, it's, it is a happy day, but it's also, in our tradition, it is the day on which the na nations pass before the king, i.e. the king with a capital K, that each nation passes before the king to be judged right. as a political entity. So, yeah, we definitely have that. Well, and Christianity does too. It's just that we lost it. You know, so Jesus' stump speech was, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. You know, he says, or he said, I'm sorry, excuse me. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Well, so when he said that, he was talking to a people who were under Roman occupation. So first it was, we all have to change our ways and how we are 
dehuman, going along with the Roman dehumanization of all of us, splitting us all into bits. And at the same time, we have to trust that we can, that, that something else can happen, that there is a brighter day ahead if we reorient ourselves to God's way of living in the world instead of the Roman way of living in the world. So repentance and trust were kind of together in that movement. Right. But what so many Christians have done is individualized the whole thing and said that as long as an individual repents, as long as an individual has trust, they're good to go. But that's not, in fact, the, the deal at all. I mean, a guy called me, told me the other day that I was working for Satan, right, on the street, uh, because I was standing with Black Lives Matter protesters and holding a sign. Uh, and I said, well, how, how can you determine that? And he said, well, because the spirit of God is within me. And I said, well, dude, you've never read the, the Christian scriptures in Greek, have you? No. Well, the word, the word of the, the, the spirit of God is among you really means the spirit of God is among all y'all. It's in the community, not in any one individual. And so he, he just had no idea. He thought everything was, was spoken to individuals when in fact, the repentance and trust or, and hope that, that Jesus is speaking about was addressed to the entire community under an unjust system. And in this unjust system, perhaps we could once again say, hey, even if we don't buy into God or whatever else, maybe we can all like take our part of our responsibility for stuff. And at the same time, we can trust that something can be built of greater hope together uh, collectively as we as we collectively repent and trust and hope in the future that we long for well i i know we're a little bit past our time um you know i really appreciate alana and hamza you all being on with us today and this this conversation you know kind of a messy conversation but i think an appropriately messy one and i just appreciate you know learning with you and from you and thanks for, for being with us tonight. I just want to thank all of you who've been listening uh, for, for being with us as well. You can listen or, or watch on YouTube, on Facebook, or also on our Paths to Understanding uh, podcast, which can be found on all major podcasting services. We want to remind you of our Facts or a Fear campaign, which we're working to counter anti-Muslim bigotry. And we encourage all of you to be well, be calm, and be good to your neighbors. Thanks for listening and or watching.